Welcome to The Fundamentals. What you're about to listen to are three young men sharing the journey of a lifetime into the depths of their minds to talk about a topic that a week ago they knew nothing about. Enjoy. I'm Martin Wallace. I'm Darren McCarthy. I am Dan Fury. And this is The Fundamentals. So what are we talking about this week? We're talking circus. We're talking all things circus. Circus Maximus. <laughs> we can start there. That is the beginning. That is the beginning. I think uh, setting the circus as the, the topic was really good. Mm -hmm. But also, like I think, I assume you found as well, it's kind of a general term for a lot of different things mm -hmm. the history of it it's like well this is what the circus was for this hundred year period like this is what the circus was for this hundred year period and then it just kept changing see i kind of found as we were going along that i just wanted to keep delaying this podcast so that i could learn more and more about really tiny details right um I was able to get a pretty comprehensive idea of the history of the thing, mm -hmm. uh, and then some kind of fun facts about incidents or individual acts, uh, but there's just so much history there, and so much of it is is full of crazy characters yeah. that I, I foresee that after doing this podcast, I will continue to study the history of the circus. I, I mean, think it, so it just became... That fascinating. And I, I think um, something you just touched on was it, it's not so much the circus itself, but you you key in on one figure. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, so I, I would be doing like, okay, just a general, like I'm going to research the circus. And then mm -hmm. you, you click on one or you, you hit on one name or mm -hmm. one act. Yeah. And then an hour later, you're like mm -hmm. still focus on that. You know, you're mm -hmm. not even back to where you started. And you could just keep – you could spend – Hours and hours and hours on a single figure in the entire history, the thousands of years of history of the circus. Well, I think we need to go back to the beginning. I think we should go back to the beginning. Yeah, we should start. Uh, See, this is the first thing that I came up with. Apparently, there is some controversy on what is the beginning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So there's the Circus Maximus, yeah, uh, which is about 500 AD when that was first really built. Before that, it was around, but it wasn't anything. It was just uh, some fence posts, essentially. Yeah. And it really, it gets sort of convoluted into the history here because it was called the circus, which is really just a translation for circle, yep. uh, which didn't even come into usage for what the modern circus was for about two or three years after the first real modern circus. And so what's happened here is that it's so hard to get away from that name. But the Circus Maximus was actually a precursor to the modern racetrack, not the circus. Yeah. It's a precursor to NASCAR, Formula One. It's And this was in Rome? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was chariot racing. It had there were no acts. It was a it was a circle that people raced on. And the other thing that I found is uh next to that you have all the these old acts that became incorporated into what we know as the modern circus that are at least that old. Things like uh clowns, which are just old court jesters, mm -hmm. you know, we have acrobatics for thousands of years, you know, before the circus, all of those acts. Um, but the circus itself is what brought all that together. Right. And that's when the modern circus sort of arrives. But none of those were a center point. It was all about equestrian tricks. That was the whole purpose. All of these, the, the clowns and uh, jugglers and this kind of stuff, was just there to keep the crowd interested while the Changing, riders took a yeah. break, you know. To this day, I think the, the standardized size of a ring mm -hmm. was something like 13 meters because that's you you need that much of a diameter for something like a man to stand on a galloping horse because mm -hmm. if it's a sharper turn like that, the horse won't gallop mm -hmm. and if it's too sharp then the guy's going to go flying, yeah. you know. So that was um, kind of the standardized version and it was solely built, that size was designed around the horse. Yeah, it was the physics. It was the yeah, physics, physics of the, of horse, the horse running. So yeah. that you could do tricks on it. The, it's a mix of that and um, the other crucial point of it is so that 
people could watch a horse at full gallop. Yep. Because otherwise, you would just watch them take off, and then you don't get all the tricks. But if it is in this standardized ring, mm -hmm. where it's just big enough... That they can go full bore, mm -hmm. and a person can still yeah. do something mm -hmm. yeah, at that angle. Now, and see, this has been around for a little while before the real beginning of the circus. The yeah. ring had been around for a while. But it wasn't until 1770 when uh, Philip Astley started a riding school. It's Rick Astley's... Great, great, <laughs> great, 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 great grandfather. What a genealogy. Yes. I mean, what? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Sorry to derail. <laughs> <laughs> so, if that were true, that mm -hmm. would be amazing. Now, I'm not on Ancestry.com, but chances are one out of the three of us it's is. Got a, it's got a trace. If that is true, we're wasting our time talking about anything <laughs> other than that. <laughs> yeah. Ancestry.com. That'll be next week's <laughs> subject. <laughs> Anyway, so, I'm sorry. So Philip Astley starts this writing school, and he gets he starts performing tricks in the circle mm -hmm. and creates a little arena for it, and uh, does very well. I mean, he's he's a, a veteran from the Seven Years' War, and and was a phenomenal writer enough that people would pay to watch so him. So this is his show. Yeah, and not only was he a great writer, but he was also a teacher. He he opened up a school before he started showing, yeah. and so. It was around two years after that, after he opens up this school, that he starts not only performing, but brings in clowns, jugglers, acrobats, just to fill space. And this is our first modern circus. Mm -hmm. Prior to this, it was all these events separated. So even in that two-year period when he was doing shows in the ring, that's not quite the circus as we know it. There's no... He wasn't generating these acts. He wasn't, you know, designing or creating new styles of performance or anything. But, mm. I mean, they're, they're, these people were touring them by themselves. Mm -hmm. And they'd have their juggling act that they, they individually would go town to town or like, their mm -hmm. family would have an act. But what he did was bring them all into one place and make it like a professional show. Now, he did so well doing this. This was before we had the big tent, mind you. So it was built in a wooden arena. And he was doing so well that it burned down. <laughs> and he had enough money to just build it again. Mm -hmm. Twice. Mm -hmm. Back to back. And I think did he kind of almost in a way like franchised into Europe, I think. Well, he, yeah, he was already in England. He was already in England. And mm -hmm. then. Yeah, he was in Wander Waterloo, London, is where I, he started. And I think he opened one in Paris, like the. Mm -hmm. At some point. I, I, don't, I don't know what year. I remember reading that he at one point had like 30 different circuses kind of started. I don't think he was managing all of them. Well, him being like the father of the circus, just about anything after him sort of owed yeah. some kind of lineage. But it wasn't until about 10 years after he first did this, since 1782, when two, uh, I don't know if I'd say friends of his, but contemporaries of his, these guys named Charles Hughes and Charles Dibden, I, I love saying the name Dibden, by the way. <laughs> mm -hmm. They were his first competitors, where they took his show and did it, I don't know, better or not. And there's really nothing that I've found to say otherwise. But they were also great writers and, of course, living in the same town from the same backgrounds, I'm sure. But it was Charles Dibden who first said circus, and he named their show the Royal Circus. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was them that really started to take it off and uh, travel around. This is kind of the, the jumping off point where not only is he is mm -hmm. he creating this business model, but other people are mm -hmm. kind of saying, yeah, that's a viable yeah. business. It's entertaining. People are paying over and over again to see the same things. Yeah. And obviously little variances here, different in between shows, different tricks, but you're going to see that same show again. You're going to see this guy ride and his friends. And I think given the historical context, mm -hmm. people aren't really traveling more than 10, 15 miles from the house. Yeah. So something like this comes through, mm -hmm. or they yeah, can, this is they can go deal. to. Yeah. What else are they going to do? I mean, think about how long ago that was. This, this is 1782. Been, this must yeah. have been such a spectacle. Mm -hmm. And yeah, America's barely become independent. And you, you think, think about, and I'm sure we'll get into this, like circus tragedies. Oh, gosh. One of these yeah. guys getting hurt then? Like, there's no, mm -hmm. like yeah. seeing someone on a horse doing mm -hmm. like uh like doing some crazy you know flip or trick mm -hmm. on our galloping horse's yeah. back. Yeah, these guys. He would... has to land. It. Like there's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, if he gets hurt, there's no ambulance or anything. It's 
Mm-hmm. It's like he's gonna eat shit. Yeah, yeah these guys started it. their tricks by standing on the horse's back at full gallop. Yeah, and that's when they started doing. I mean, it's BMX at the time. You yeah, know? except the bike's alive. And yeah, it weighs twelve hundred pounds. <laughs> yeah, and you don't got paramedics on site. There's no antibiotics. Mm-hmm. There's no. I mean, yeah. So I think that. It's kind of the like the modern circus. Mm-hmm. As that was the beginning of the professional. What we would recognize, like the professional yeah. circus, and then from there uh, went. I, I guess strength to strength for the mm-hmm. next at least 150, 175 years or so. Um, yeah, I mean, it didn't start dwindling until about 19, the late forties. Late forties, yeah. I 1940s. mean, even the two world wars didn't slow it down. Yeah. Uh, one of the funny things is in uh, in Germany, in between World War One and World War Two, it was more popular than it had ever been. Yeah. Oh. After World War One, it was it was the thing. Anything to mm. take your mind off. Right. It. And and of course, you got to keep in mind during this period and for about one hundred seventy five to one hundred years before this, it is the most popular thing yeah. in just about every continent. Anywhere it went, there was no bigger entertainment. And and since its inception, it only got crazier and crazier. So was it primarily a mobile uh, It didn't start that way. It wasn't until uh, the Americans kind of made it that way. Yeah. So you get into that a little bit later in like uh, 17, uh, 1793. So about 11 years after there were the two circuses, it shows up in America. And uh, one of the interesting things is, is because America is at, at that point in the early 19th century, the way that it was, was uh, such a developing a new country, you didn't have big towns like you did in Europe. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in Europe, you had circus has a competition for the theater, which was already a great entertainment. And so you would build a, a wooden building, and in that you would put your circus on. And so people would come to your theater. You were just doing circus acts and not mm-hmm. Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. In America, you couldn't do that because there weren't any towns big enough to... Like on the Supply in, between, in between the major cities, yeah. So, and on top of that, the frontier just keeps getting pushed westward and westward every day. You know, people are leaving cities and starting even less populated ones. So, in America, it was still as popular as it was in Europe, but you had to move it. And I think that's why a and, lot of the American theaters or American uh, circuses. Mm-hmm. weren't the massive spectacles that they would later become mm-hmm. until until the introduction of the, the traveling circus on the railroad and mm-hmm. utilizing a railroad to... It's eventually, you know, you have these trains that are a mile long mm-hmm. just for this one show. Yeah. You know, and it's 40, 40 freight cars of just a freight and then 20 cars for passengers and animals yeah. and stuff. It took up five acres. Yeah. And it was five big top tents... And then sleeping quarters for the... Everybody. Yeah, the unbelievable... All the acts, all the people that were working it, setting it up. I mean, it was an unbelievable amount of people that were required to work these things. Yeah. Do you know how long they would stay in one? Just a day, typically. One day. Yeah, they would yeah. set it up, take it down, be into the next place. And uh, a lot of that gets owed to uh, William Coop, who was a, a much smaller time circus guy. And of course, this is in... The late 1800s, so the circus had been in full swing for a while now, but it was him who, more or less, they had to wait until after the Civil War to get the train system really set up. That's just the reality of the thing. Before that, it was wagons, and so it would take you forever and to get from one city to the other. And I was reading accounts of, uh, you know, if there's some kind of rainstorm, you have wagons full of so much heavy stuff and all this cattle to carry them, and they couldn't. And, and there are accounts of them hooking up the elephants. So the elephants would just drag them through the slop. Oh, wow. And even then, you couldn't get anywhere. <laughs> it took forever. So it wasn't until, you know, Barnum and, and Koo, and Koo takes all the credit for this, although I was reading a couple things about Barnum that kind of defend him, but there's really no evidence one way or the other that I found. It sure seems to be that, that it was Koo's idea, if not the idea to do it, the one who really figured out um, the logistics of, packing everything up in one day, getting it all on this train, and getting it to the next place. And then uh, they were also the first ones to do uh, more than one ring. So yeah. prior to this, prior to uh, them, it was always just one ring. And they wanted to show so much bigger. So they did two, three, four, five rings so that 
didn't matter where you sat, and it was really just a matter of getting people in the door. It was yeah. uh, more people in seats. So you could sit anywhere in this thing and still get a show instead of having a limited capacity to view one thing. Because you can only go so far high in a tent. And especially if you're building it, setting it up, mm-hmm. tearing it down, yeah. there's just structural mm-hmm. time. So yeah, they were the ones that figured out how to get all this stuff moving. So for about 100 years in between that, there was a lot of traveling. But it was um, town to town. It was mm-hmm. like, you know, we're only going to go 10, 15 miles because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. that's just physically all we can do. And, I, and that also, I think you're playing in smaller venues, mm-hmm. smaller towns, which is smaller populations. Yeah. So they're all, they, can, they can't afford to stay there for more than a day or two. Everyone in town is going to see it. Mm-hmm. The I, they probably see it two, three times. But even yeah. then, are you really getting that kind of revenue? Yeah. You know. You know, and the money, the money is in the bigger towns where you can mm-hmm. stay. So you want to get there as fast as possible. Yeah. But and you're trying to pay three, four, five hundred people. On top of you yeah. being, you know, the proprietor of the thing, making real money. Yeah. In the late seventeen, early eighteen hundreds, I mean, that's. It's a tall. You got to bring in a lot of cash. Yeah. You got to get a lot of people to come see it. Yeah. And bring in new acts. Mm-hmm. So, are there any major points between, like, eighteen hundred and nineteen hundred, in evolution of what the circus is? Yes. 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 So, uh, what happens is uh, after Astley's whole starting of what we would recognize as the modern circus and this is the european circus that kind of stays that way for about 80 or so years so from like 1770 to late 1800s uh, that's pretty much the deal it doesn't travel it has its place next to the theater but that isn't to say that it doesn't travel travel internationally because one of the things that they found with a thing like the circus, especially in the American, once the Americans sort of figured out how to travel it with wagons, it became a worldwide sensation where this was the first thing that was sort of exported to mm-hmm. Japan, to China, uh, to Fiji, to Honolulu. They would bring this thing all around the world. And it just so happens that a thing like the circus crosses language barriers. You don't need to speak the language of the circus, where it comes from, in order to enjoy it. Even the clowns at this point stopped talking. And I think conversely, too, a lot of stuff came back. Mm -hmm. And some of the the freak show element is just, there's no language. Mm -hmm. It's just like, this is something we found in the jungle. You know, (laughs) it's it's really some guy from New Jersey, but it's, you know, (laughs) they they say back from the world tour. They dress him up in the thing. Yeah, they'd give him a spear and they'd say he was some... Someone from... Some far off thing, yeah. Um, Native tribes cannibal. And then, you know, and then bring, but bring the show around the world. You can just do the same thing. I mean, it doesn't, that doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You bring it from. And even if you go to where you're saying he's from, all you do is just change the name. Yeah. (laughs) You know, it's amazing how that worked. There was nothing but deceit through the whole thing. But Barnum actually has like a really great uh, sort of quote on that because he is known as one of the most masterful deceivers of the whole thing. He, Mm -hmm. uh, he has, and, I, and we, we can touch really more on him in a little bit because he just has too much to talk about. Yeah. Um, but he... And the circus is just one part of his story, too. Yeah. We, could, mean, we could do a whole thing that, that, on Barnum's that, life. That, that was kind of a, a, like a whole... Mm-hmm. That's just the this, this separate secondary story. Before we do that, I have the, the question of what's the origin of a clown? So clowns, as far as we know, uh, it's just as sort of convoluted as uh, all the other acts. Uh, a lot of these things have been around for a while. Uh, like Things like uh, Flying Trapeze, we know when that started. That's a modern development. Right. Uh, that mm-hmm. was a guy named uh, Jules Leotard, mm-hmm. who also happened to invent the Leotard. <laughs> and so people it. yeah, came to see him not just because of the Flying Trapeze that he invented and was the gymnast doing but because he was wearing a leotard and no one had ever seen one and it was yeah. uh quite the talk about town if you can imagine <laughs> um, but things like uh like juggling yeah. you know it, yeah. it to ask when did the clown start is to to ask when did juggling start and sure there's probably some kind of record somewhere of the first time somebody was like that's juggling but there isn't really it's just something that somebody did and and as far as i can tell the earliest record we have of a clown is has a court jester in the fifth 
uh, dynasty of Egypt, which yeah. is about 2400 BC. And that Holy it probably goes back before that has at least the idea. It's a court jester is where clowns come from. Right. And then it was a long history in the theater long before it became a circus thing. So how clowns bran branched off and became a circus thing and why you hardly see them in theater anymore, uh, at least the differences between them, is um, clowns were sort of an archetype, right? And you would know this better as yeah. somebody in theater. It's an archetype. It's a character. Yeah. Whereas in the circus, they still have their own archetypes in it, but has the ring became too big to hear anybody speak, they became all about practical jokes and physical humor. And that's what we know as the circus clown is this okay. pie to the face, this how many people are getting out of the car, this like, yeah. and you, they're kind of funny. They actually have like a hierarchy system. So you have like that white face clown, the one that you uh, probably most easily recognize the, they don't show any flesh. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. And like, it, that's, that's the iconic image that we have. Mm -hmm. the clown, mm -hmm. This white face and a, and a honky nose. Mm -hmm. So they get paid the most. Okay. And then below them is uh, something called the August, and they just have the other makeup. They don't get the white makeup, but they get, you know, the big red smile. They get the thing on the eyes. They get okay. the nose, but they don't have all the white. And what happens is the, uh, the white face clown is in charge. Mm -hmm. The August is the one that the pranks happen to. So there's a clown with a pie, and there's a clown who's getting a pie to the face. And it's always the August who gets it. And this is this is something. It's um, it's based on status mm -hmm. within the group of clowns, and you'll see this stuff in uh, the Marx Brothers, the Three Stooges. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's yeah, it, yeah. You can actually look at those and tell who is which type of clown, even though they're not wearing makeup. They're yeah. not. And, but and, who's getting the gag? Who's giving the gag? Uh, blue, blue Man Group. Mm -hmm. Another example. Yeah. It's just you know, it's one, two, three. Left, right, mm -hmm. center. Left guy always is this. Center guy always is this. Right guy always does this. They have this kind of personality, this reaction to something. Um, so in terms of like, who, yeah, when did the clown first start? I guess my question is, when does the white face clown mm -hmm. approximately uh, figure into this whole thing? There's this guy, Joseph Grimaldi. He was kind of billed as the first mainstream clown. So like, it's like early 1800s. Charles Dickens wrote his biography. That's something. Yeah. Wow. Today's clowns are often called Joey's in honor of Joseph Grimaldi. No. Here's a fact. Whether or not he was actually the first person to do it, though, again. That's just what we have. And it looks like, from what I'm seeing here, it looks like he was uh, the first to use this makeup and that kind of thing. Um, and it looks very like, significant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that might be an, uh, the answer to your question. He might mm -hmm. be the first that we have who, who made that iconic image of the clown as we know it today. But the, uh, the act of the clown goes back way, way farther. Yeah. And I think, yeah. I think that the skills and kind of the, the bag of tricks that we would recognize in clowns even to this day, yeah. that's, mm -hmm. I mean, that's like Genesis. Right. I mean, that's like the original the original kind of performance. I think we need to talk about Somers, New York for a second. It's it's like a, it's such a quick moment in circus history that that added so much and uh, is just it's kind of a weird event that happens. Um, so it's 1825. Circus has been around for a little while and at this point it's it's traveling a little bit and it's in America. Uh, been in America for almost a little bit over 30 years. It's in Montreal. It's in Mexico by now. And there's a guy named Joshua Purdy Brown. And he's from a place called Somers, New York. And uh, he's a circus entrepreneur. And he's the first guy to get rid of wooden construction, which is what they would do. So they would go to a place, set up a wooden building. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then that would be where it was. And it was his idea to use a canvas tent. And, of course, that saved so much time. Mm -hmm. It saved materials, money, the whole thing. So that was a big deal. But it's, it's weird that he comes from this area. Uh, there was a guy in the same time. This is 1825 uh, to the 1830s. And there was a guy there named, uh, and I'm going to butcher this name really bad, uh, <laughs> Hekaliah Bailey. Heka, yeah, it's got to be Hekaliah. Hekaliah. And he was a, uh, a cattle dealer, and he had purchased a young African elephant. 
Mm. Which he exhibited around for a great deal of money. I mean, nobody in America has seen an elephant. And then there was uh, other exotic animals sort of got brought into this by uh, other people who were willing to finance uh, his friends of his that were willing to put some money down and, and he himself from the money that he was making. And all these other farmers from this area began to go into this uh, traveling menagerie business, mm-hmm. right? The showing of exotic animals. And in 1835, a group of 135 farmers and menagerie owners, all from more or less the vicinity of the Somers area, created a thing called the Zoological Institute. Uh, and that was a trust that controlled 13 menageries and three affiliated circuses. Uh, and this was the first time that the really the circus as we know it now, or at least in its pop culture heyday, is born. Mm-hmm. So prior to this, it was all these acts. It was all this. Uh, but for the first time ever, it was that. But you also got your lions. You got... Your, uh, the exotic animals. Yeah, you got your elephants. You got all these, you know, tamed exotic things that nobody had ever seen, you and, know? And I think that is that is kind of a diversion point, too, mm-hmm. in the history. Yeah. So, so at this point, they are taming them, and somebody is directing them to do things? Or is it more of like a zoo aspect? So when it begins, it's it's much more harsh than a zoo. It's them in a cage, and you kind of just walk through it. Yeah on your way to the big tent. Okay. So what happens is you gate admittance. So it's more zoo-like. Yeah, but it's worse than that. It's, it's like, like a jail. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's just small cages. I mean, they don't yeah. know what to do with these things. You have a tiger, and nobody knows what the hell that even is. I mean, we're talking 1835. Yeah, tigers uh, a bunch of migrated to the United States. Yeah, yeah. a bunch <laughs> of farmers from New York yeah. decided they could make money off exotic animals, and, and I don't think they quite knew what to do with things like jaguars. Right. Um, this is a kind of a, a little bit off topic, but while I was doing research, I did like an mm-hmm. image search, and when the this, this big cat circus is it seemed pretty modern, you know, in the last twenty mm-hmm. years, mm-hmm. and it had five, four or five tigers kind of sitting back on their haunches, like with their mm-hmm. their paws up, like mm-hmm. like you know, you like I think of like a house cat, it's like begging right. for for food. Oh wow! And like the the. The, the lion tamer guy is just standing with his back to them and is looking out. Tigers are so big. <laughs> oh, God. Like, I, oh, I, you yeah. know, I, it, it, and of course, it's like been all these tragedies of people yeah. being attacked and stuff. It's strong. But just strong. like something like that, you're the first group to bring in yeah, a tiger. That's huge. Mm-hmm. And you have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> you know? There had to have been some. Some uh, incidences. Oh, I'm sure. I'm up. sure. <laughs> you know, I mean, and it's not exactly like there was that much of a barrier between you and the the right. animal. You went up like, oh, it's a cat. I'll pet it. Yeah, yeah but no it's a, it's like a six hundred pound, pound cat. cat that moves faster than lightning, mm. <laughs> and is and is kept in the, mm. is basically just tortured. Well, and this is kind of an interesting point, is because it, it, it's right here um, in 1825 that this. This begins this menagerie aspect, and for about 150 years, this is one of its biggest, most important pieces. Yeah, this is what's drawing a lot of people in, and it's uh, also the beginning of its downfall. Mm-hmm. But it rose so high after that; it was such a good thing for the circus and and for the public. Um, but they just couldn't foresee that had they have not done that, the circus as it was would remain the same today. Yeah. But about 130 years, 140 years later, PETA gets pissed. Oh. <laughs> and they shut it down. And that's really leads to what we have now as, as uh, the, the new of, circus. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that kind of, yeah, that kind of brings you up to the, the mm. 80s, 1980s or so. And, and to be fair, they're... Sure, they had those things trained. I mean, that it's incredible what they were able to do. I mean, think about putting your head in a lion's mouth mm-hmm. in front of people 360 days of the year. Yeah. I mean, that's crazy. And they had that thing trained so well. But what they did to it yeah. to get it there, I... That was, that was actually... It was kind of a hard part of this research for me with the animal side of this. You know, tra- training 
uh, again, tires mm-hmm. who are instinctually deathly afraid of fire. Mm-hmm. And you're forcing them to jump through flaming rings. And then, yeah. and, and then what happens when that animal, its instincts and its it just prime, becomes primal, yeah. Prime yeah. nature takes over. You know, you're yeah, you put your head in the mouth in front of a couple thousand people and it's mm-hmm. one of uh, the most horrific stories I've ever heard or come across comes up and I'm sorry to bring this down, but it's kind Let's of do it. Let's get it. Um, starts off with this is September twelfth, nineteen sixteen, an elephant uh, named Mary tramples her handler. And kills the guy. Mm-hmm. This is happening in a little town of Kingsport, Tennessee. 1916. 1916. So the townspeople, the crowd that saw this elephant kill this man, mm-hmm. decide that Mary has to hang for her crime. Oh my god. What? So. That's not a thing you do to an <laughs> elephant? So now the next day. I talk about like really, really silly human reasoning. Talk about. It, his practicality. Yeah. So now, a crowd of 2,500 people, roughly 2,500 people, mostly children. I got a picture of it here. No. Oh, man. They all uh, get together, and Mary's hung from the neck. Oh, you got to be kidding me. By, by an industrial crane. Now, this is an elephant. Yeah. The chain snaps. She slams to the ground, breaking her hip. Still alive. So they go back and they get a bigger chain and they hang her again and she swings for half an hour. Before she dies? Well, I think she probably died faster, but they hang her for half an hour and then they just, they dig a big grave and dump this elephant. Okay, I just looked at that picture and I'm tearing up right now. Is Is that not, that is Honestly, I mean, if if you can stomach it, look up a a Google image search of Mary the Elephant. I mean, it's just one of the most bizarre so things awful. you could imagine human beings deciding look, to do. It's just so and, and weird. I, and I think, too, the, qual- the quality of the film from the time, too, it doesn't look real. To me. It no, it, like adds, good, it adds, it like, this air. Of, it looks yeah. like a like a charcoal mm-hmm. drawing of, yeah. from some sick, twisted fever dream. Right. But Yeah, it's like a, it's, it's like a really... Grainy, black and white. And, and, and I, I, think, I think you kind of hope that it's not real. No, in a way. I mean, I almost imagine it's like a, a weird sort of surrealist painting by someone who was really influenced by Dolly. Yeah. You know, like this elephant and then this, it's just. It doesn't, it, it looks, and I think too, looking at it, it looks so unnatural, the way that the, the elephant hangs. Mm. Yeah. It, Although I, I guess now that I'm looking at it, I can't imagine an elephant hanging in any, any other, other way, way. But you just never see that. Yeah. This is also a thing, like I'm looking at it, no wonder, there. there's you know, no way that that is... You're looking at the black and white one. Yeah. There's a, there's a sepia version of it that looks like the original, and that's that, that seems pretty real. But still just absolutely crazy. Yeah. That was And, and that, I, I kind of went off a little bit on a, a tangent a little bit about the, the animal aspect of this. I, mm-hmm. I, you know, I love animals, and mm-hmm. um, it, I, I'm kind of, I, I personally am kind of like against zoos in general. I think yeah. I mean, it's like animal jail when... Um, yeah, you know, I'm I'm all about conservation, and if it's like a an animal reserve or I'm trying to save the species, but just to have an animal, just to like, just to Drop look it. at it, mm-hmm. in, you know, in a tiny enclosure, and I think the circus, that side of the circus's history, is pretty dark. Mm-hmm. It's torture, you mm-hmm. know, what what all these animals went through. I yeah. gotta say, uh, I ask you a question now that uh, we're talking about circus disasters here. Oh boy, so there's a great many of them. <laughs> there's uh, a lot. I'm just curious if you recognize this tune. Yeah. Of course. So this is a song called The Stars and Stripes Forever. And this was code. Uh, this is this is a really interesting thing. So the... I, I think... I think we should ask... All right, so, so Dan, do you, know, do you know what this signifies? I do not. If you're well, at a circus just, and the band starts like playing this... Yeah. Or if, if you hear the song, what do you think of? It's like a, it's a march. It's a, it's a. And the, and the circus orchestra would play nothing, uh, almost exclusively marches and waltzes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that well, which of course is very popular at the time. Yeah, like eighteen hundreds. But this song in particular has a lot of uh, significance, and uh, I can't listen to it the same way anymore. Yeah. Um, so this song was played 
has code for all of the circus employees, clowns in particular, but for everyone, that something has gone terribly wrong. It's a disaster. <laughs> really? Yeah, so that way they could get the message out through the whole circus without the uh, ringmaster letting the audience know. Um, so what terrifies me here... Um, is any time you ever hear that song again? <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Now, yeah, this is like the call, like, this is like all hands on deck. Mm -hmm. So on, on July 6th of 1944, the Ringling Brothers yeah. were having a show in Hartford, Connecticut. And there were about 7,000 people there. Yeah. Right? So this is 1944. Uh, we're far into the history of the circus. Actually, we're nearly done with the... The circus as we knew it now. Yeah, kind of yeah. modern era. Of yeah, we're only about 10 years out from the change. So, a fire began to spread along the canvas tent of this circus. And that song began to play. Not, not only did it begin, it was set. It was arson. Mm -hmm. um, I forget the guy's name. I'm sure it's in these notes somewhere. I imagine there was a lot of that. Yeah, and mm -hmm. this, this guy set fire the tent. He was an arsonist. In I think in his, I can't remember his name, but I remember that in his dreams there was some like a, a tiger in flames telling him to burn the circus down. Oh, There's actually a, like a long history of circus arson. Yeah, it's really bizarre. Yeah. I, I think that was a much more common thing back then. I mean, yeah. when you go back to the very first circuses, uh, Astley's, um, the the very first circus burned down twice, really, really soon, and and we don't know if it's arson or not. This is also things just structures made of wood. Yeah, I mean you get a bunch of people. You have gas, kerosene, lanterns. Mm -hmm. Things just burned down a lot more back then. Yeah. From I think that's the most interesting I've learned from studying the circus is that stuff was impermanent. Yeah, things <laughs> burned all the time. It's weird. Uh, and then you look at some of like Barnum and Bailey's uh, shows. Uh, it's post Civil War, and uh, Barnum was a Union supporter and very very vocal about it. Uh, and there were a lot of uh, Confederates that would burn his showdown while it was going this day however that that song we were just listening to starts playing stars and stripes and and they act quick enough that they get all of the animals out of the tent mm -hmm. right but the people the seven thousand people once they realize there's a fire sort of go into this mass hysteria and they start stampeding towards the entrance that they came in which is the end that's on fire. And the employees are trying to usher these people to the other side. And the band is playing Stars and Stripes Forever. Yep. Has 168 men, women, and children burned to their deaths. So a lot were trampled. And a first. lot more, yeah. So people were being crushed, and mm -hmm. the people behind them can't get out, so mm -hmm. they're just burning to death. So there's, there's two things to keep in mind here that's really unfortunate about this uh, disaster is they were all just in this stampeding herd instinct to leave in the only way they thought they could, which was the only entrance that they went in, um, when there was another viable one that was far away from being on fire. And the second is it's a canvas tent that's gone up in flames and a lot of it is open, but nobody ran out the sides mm -hmm. because it didn't make sense. You're in a panic mode. The only thing you think of is the doorway. Mm -hmm. And that's really freaky and bizarre to me is that you could have just spread out the sides. Yeah. It was they, made they, out of canvas. They, yeah. they do close those. I, mm. <laughs> Kind of, uh, but they've gone up in flames. They've gone up in flames, yeah. right? Yeah. It's but I think there's also str stuff falling and oh yeah, it's terrifying. I'm, and yeah. also I think there's auxiliary things on the outside. Mm -hmm. You know. Also, so you're in a panic and everybody else seems to be going, going this way. And that's, you don't have a choice, really. Mm -hmm. If you're in the oh, middle, yeah. you're going with that crowd. Mm -hmm. Another uh, little yeah, little problem with that was the coating on the canvas tent. Yeah, this the is an interesting thing. Yeah, the, this so is it's canvas and it's outside. Mm -hmm. So if it rains, it would be pretty ruined. So to waterproof it, they um, dissolve paraffin wax in gasoline oh, no. and use that as a waterproofing. 
So when this thing goes, I talk mean, about it's, history it's weekly. fires. It's yeah. just going up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's nothing that's going to stop it. Uh, I think there was yeah, Emmett Kelly, the tramp clown, <laughs> he threw a bucket of water at the burning <laughs> canvas. Did not put it out though. Um, oh yeah, I guess the side walls were open too. Yeah, it's just a it's a weird thing to imagine. So now now I listen to that song and all I can think about is horrible tragedy. It's, well, it's not only that one, but that one sticks out to me in particular. Yeah. This burning of the tent and that many people dying has this band is just trying to alert of danger, and that's the song. It's this upbeat march. Mm-hmm. That is a very patriotic tune. It's, there's just something eerie about that. Something very, uh, almost like something you'd read in a short novel. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. in some sort of short story. It's just too weird. But that's what it was. You know, not quite as many disasters or deaths as I expected. Yeah, it's 170 people died out of 7,000 or something. Mm-hmm. But well, I don't mean in that event in particular. Oh, but in just general. in the history. I mean, there are a lot of really tragic events, and and there have been some in the modern era too. Cirque du Soleil had a really really bad accident. I expected to see, especially in like the early history, a lot more like really bad mangled stuff. But mm-hmm. some people were fine for the most part, you know. I think um, this is another thing that if people are interested in doing like a, an image search of the Hartford, Connecticut circus fire, I didn't um, think to look it up. Yeah, I, picture. you know, because I, I, there were a few, a few images, just within like the text, you know, bodies of text that I was reading and stuff, and it, it's like. It looks like the Hindenburg coming down. You know, it's just, it's this massive structure that's mostly air on the inside. Mm-hmm. Just going up so fast, people freaking out, panicking. Mm-hmm. No, clearly no one knows what's going on. Um, it's yeah. tough stuff. Yeah. I think we need to cover Barnum and Bailey because I think that kind of represents... It's the greatest the show on Earth. Yeah, yeah that was the greatest show on Earth. Uh, so so what we have so far is sort of, uh, uh, we need to talk about the difference between the European circus yeah. and the American circus. And so far what we have is the difference is uh, the American circus is a traveling menagerie with the circus acts. And in Europe, you just have the circus. The circus. Yeah, and they did travel. We talked about the international stuff. And there was a guy named uh, Louis Solier, a French a Frenchman who went to uh, China and brought back Chinese acrobats and brought that into it. And, and so there is a lot of that sort of intermingling that happens. But for the most part, it was brought back as a, a hometown theater and it would travel to those different theaters, which is more or less kind of how it's done now. Like Cirque du Soleil is this act that goes to different... They don't set up the tent. They don't do the thing. They go to... They do. They, they ha- they, I guess I've never seen that, but they have like the Vegas shows. I mean, they run like... But they, they are kind of... All these shows at the same time. The scale they do things. Mm-hmm. So they might have something like 15 to 20 individual shows, mm-hmm. some of which are only ever in Vegas, you know, and then mm-hmm. some that tour, mm-hmm. uh, some that tour just to theaters, like yeah. existing brick and mortar theaters, some mm-hmm. that tour with the tent. Mm-hmm. Um, a few come, come here, come to town, mm-hmm. I have come to town since I've lived here, and it's, it's a tent. There is, uh, a circus in town, actually, in Portland, a place called the uh, Wanderlust. Wanderlust, yeah. yeah. And they used to perform in what is uh, Branks and Retore before that was a venue. Really? That was their circus house. Yeah. Isn't that kind of weird? Before it was ever a venue, like 10 years ago? or Yeah. Oh, wow. It was that before it was the venue. Wow. Oh, which I found really fascinating because I've been in both the basement and the upstairs there. Mm-hmm. And uh, I can't imagine that being a place where a circus Not was. At all. But it is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So the difference really between the American and the European circus is this uh, traveling show and uh, the menagerie part. Yeah. Uh, I think in, in particular the Barnum and Bailey, they, the scale they were at. They added a whole different element to it, and this is one of the fascinating things about Barnum, is that he brought in the sideshow and the yeah. museum. Yeah. So this is when you got to see the freaks. Yeah. This is when you got to see the bearded ladies, yes. you know, and this isn't until uh, 1872. He didn't get into the circus business until his early 60s. Oh, yeah, 61. Oh, right. yeah. yeah. And that's why he's he was by far the most fascinating character to me because everybody else in the history of the circus had been born into a family of circus performers or entrepreneurs. So you had since Astley. You had these people that started that, and then the Somers, New York folk, and then it was just these families that did it. 
And a lot of these great uh, circus families, going back to the international traveling thing, it's kind of interesting. Uh, you had foreigners who started dynasty clans of circuses in foreign countries because mm-hmm. they would move there. So you have uh, French names in Russia running the Russian circus. Mm-hmm. You have Russians in France. You have Swedes in Japan. It's just, it, it became irrelevant, right? But Barnum spent the first 60 years of his life being more or less a marketer yeah he he made it incredibly rich three times in his life bill gates rich and went bankrupt twice for three entirely different enterprises yeah and he's fascinating because of that so he he grew up in this uh small town connecticut uh and was just kind of a born into a family of pranksters essentially and they were doing fine. They'd make some money, and they would travel to New York and stuff, and they, they were doing all right. But he would sort of grow into uh, the lottery business as that was taking off, mm-hmm. made all of his money in the lottery, and then spent a lot of that money on uh, running museums. The museum thing was interesting to me. And that's, yeah. Collect, the kind of just collecting oddities as much as yeah. you know, what we consider art. You know, so just, is this kind of the genesis of the Ripley's Division or not? It, he's exactly that, but I never knew that. Yeah. He was a Ripley's, but so he Madame was... Madame Tussauds, like, yeah. wax museum. He would have mm-hmm. wax figurines. And... Mm-hmm. Yeah, he would have uh, little figures of the, the seven great wonders of the world, and you could come by and see those. And then what he would do, which was kind of interesting, is he would buy a piece from somebody that they had, but they weren't really using or making that much money off of. And what he would do is he was so unbelievably good at marketing that he would make this item popular before he showed it. So a case in point, he ran uh, a mermaid. It was essentially the top of a monkey that had been sewn to the bottom of a fish. And it looked like garbage. I have pictures of it, and you can find it online. It, it's the fa- it's, it's the most fake. It's oh, like, no. yeah. It was a stuffed animals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Look yeah. Yeah. And it's been shown around the country by other people. But what he did was before he showed it, he had his hands in uh, newspaper publishing. He ran newspapers for a long time, and then he had journalists on the inside. And what he would do is he would write letters from England to other newspapers in different cities. He's in New York, and he's showing it in New York, but he hasn't even released it yet. So what he's done is he's, he's... plagiarized, not plagiarized, he's just faked these letters as a scientist and sent them to different newspapers like Philadelphia yeah. and then taken that article and published it in the New York newspapers. So what the public was reading was something that seemed incredibly scientific. It was a European scientist talking about something in Philadelphia that then would Which show up in New York. York. So everybody was like, what the hell is this? This has to be real. I mean, like, we're getting all this hard science from nothing to do with us. It'd be small little slides, you know? It wasn't like, come see this great thing. It was like, oh, no, this is, this is real. This is it the real is thing. published. Yeah. yeah, and then there would be great ads. He would distribute these great ads about this mermaid. And then you'd show up, and it would just be this gross thing. But people <laughs> would go see it five, six, seven times in a row. They'd pay top dollar just to walk in again. He was just a great, great marketer. He had um, not a lot of scruples in what he presented mm-mm. to the to the public. No. Uh, did, did you come across what his first, I guess, showpiece was when he first moved to New York? Past the lottery. I, the, the first thing I remember him doing is Tom Thumb. So it's before Tom Thumb. Even, this is 1835. He buys and, be, and then begins showing... A blind and oh no, I com- do remember this. Completely Absolutely, yeah. paralyzed slave woman, 160 years old, named Joyce Heth, mm-hmm. claimed by by Barnum. Uh, yeah, that she was 160 yeah. years old and that she had been George Washington's nurse. Mm-hmm. She yeah. was yeah. basically just a slave woman mm-hmm. who was blind and paralyzed and was 80 years old. Uh-huh. <laughs> that was his. Fr- and then and he, he would just make and, money by and, showing her up. Yeah. 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 And she would regale you with stories about George Washington that he had just told her to say. Yeah. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. 
Made a ton of money doing that. Made a ton of money doing that. And uh, I was reading something about how, depending on what state he was in, uh, her attitude towards the politics of the time would yeah. change no matter where they went. Yeah. So it would, it would play to the state's mm-hmm. demographic. Mm-hmm. So she would be more or less conservative depending on where she was. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, Gen- Tom Thumb, <laughs> also stage name of General Tom Thumb. General Tom Thumb. Now, his billing, his, like, his little tagline... <laughs> is the shortest person to have ever walked alone. <laughs> I, what was, great language There's that. something about that that just, um, oh, just... And how, what was his type? Basically, he, he was, was he was four years old. <laughs> yeah, well, he stopped. Right, yeah, he he stopped growing. He stopped four, growing at four. Yeah, yeah, he just something happened to him. Yeah. He stopped. Uh, how tall is a two-year-old? Two, we had 25 inches tall, two feet tall. Yeah, he's incredibly small. Oh, oh my god! Uh, yeah, and so pretty much leases this guy, this this child, from his father. Gives his father a bunch of money to keep him around. And this says that he was 15 pounds, and he's tiny. He might actually be the, sh- the shortest person to have yeah. ever walked alone. Barnum spent a lot of time with midgets because after. And not just me, just being like incredibly tiny dwarfs. Like he found all of them because after this, he had like a series of shows yeah. where there were yeah. like they, he got Tom Thumb married and had a child and the child was too quick in their show to become bigger than his parents because <laughs> Tom got with another dwarf before long. The kid was too big for them to hold. Oh, and wow. so then they would just replace it with a baby at every show <laughs> that wasn't their baby. Oh, you know. Weird. So Tom Thumb's four years old, right? And Barnum is like, this is a show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <You> <laughs> <know>? This is <laughs> a show. Is. So what he does is he, he – the dad uh, wasn't too thrilled to have a dwarf as a son, but was paid quite a bit of money, something like yeah. $15 a day. Barnum was good for it. Yeah, Barnum was just and, – and keeping them in his house. He, they were living in his museum essentially. Yeah. But Barnum loved this kid. And apparently he was, uh, from four years old, was a, a very quick mimic. Was really, really good at that, and the that's, show. That's where the show... He wasn't just short. He wasn't just an oddity. You could make him dance no, he was sing. Yeah, he, he was, was taught to dance. He was incredibly quick-witted Mind immediately. famous people. I mean, yeah. so that's where the, the general comes in. He would, he would impersonate Napoleon. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> at five years old... So, so he's, he's four years old when Barnum finds him and starts showing him off. But he claims he's 11. Yeah. So this 11-year-old kid is incredibly tiny, and granted he's four. By the time he's five years old, he's drinking wine. Yeah. (laughs) By the time he's seven, he's routinely smoking cigars because it's funny on stage. Yeah. He's impersonating whatever. He's seven years old smoking the cigar. But people think he's 11. He's just small, so it looks funny. I was I was also reading about this really interesting thing that would happen to women around him because he was technically old enough but he still looked like a child, that women had this, and he's, he's very, very popular. It wasn't just like this, it wasn't just an oddity. I mean, he was like a part of pop culture at the yeah. time. He was a celebrity by all accounts. That women were would have this weird urge of wanting to hold him like a baby, but take them as a lover. Mm-hmm. And it was just this weird thing that would happen to him. So he started charging 25 cents a kiss at every show. And he would kiss women. Nice. Yeah. What a gig, huh? Mm-hmm. And, and the thing is, he's like seven, and he's so quick-witted about it yeah. that on stage he'll say, I've kissed a billion women. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. It's a lot of quarters. Mm-hmm. So this this guy lived to be 45. 45. Mm-hmm. But he, I don't think he ever grew. He started to he grow grew, at he some grew point. He grew to three feet, three feet mm-hmm. six, three feet four inches. He saw, and this is the beautiful thing about Tom Thumb, I think the lesson three. here, is that he saw his height as a gift, yeah, not as a curse. He loved his life. Mm-hmm. He well, I mean, he was surrounded by great people. He got and pretty. And, he got pretty lucky. Yeah, had he, he been, been you know born into coal mining, because probably Barnum wouldn't have been was so a, great. But Barnum was a fan, like a relative, I think, like, or distant cousin. Or there was some mm-hmm. connection. Well, he just took him in as very, a son. Very distant. Yeah. Spent every yeah every day with him. But yeah, you, you think him. you want to talk about what? if you you. Half? 
half fifth cousin twice removed. I don't know what that means. <laughs> that, what is a half fifth cousin? That's like, and a, then you get removed. What is that? That's next week. So we're going to talk, talk about, about cousins. Yeah, what, <laughs> what is that about? Yeah, that that's like basic. That's like your second grade wow. teacher. That's the same connection. Yeah, yeah pretty much same level. That's, that's, I mean, so we, we could have a whole other part podcast about Barnum. I mean, he is so really fascinating. He really yeah, is. He is by far my favorite person. And, and I think uh, there are some some really incredible things about him, and also some of the just things were by today's mm-hmm. standards. Mm-hmm. You kind of think like that sure. is in. Mm-hmm. Insane that that's how you so live he, your life. Yeah, he wrote a, an autobiography that is so charming and charismatic. You can tell just by the way that he writes that he would have been a fascinating person to have for dinner. I mean, just listening to him reading his stories that had nothing to do with any of the real interesting stuff that ends up happening to him is so charming, witty, witty and, and funny and engaging. He had to have been such a presence. Yeah. On top of the fact that you're, you're, we're talking about the guy who at the time sought out and got to see more oddities and unusual things on the planet than anyone else alive. So he was the perfect storm. He could have walked into a room. He was really good friends with Mark Twain. And Mark Twain loved his autobiography so much that he would stay up at night under gaslight to read it. Mm-hmm. And that's fascinating. Uh, he, he talks about he's, he's eight years old. And there's this 11-year-old bully that he's kind of friends with. And he respects the guy, but he's a bully and he's just older and whatever. And they go out ice skating one day. And this 11-year-old goes off a little too far into the thinner area just to show off, falls in. And there's a bunch of eight-year-olds. And this kid's been bullying them. And they all just kind of watch him sit in the ice. And they just kind of go, he's screaming for help and whatever. And he comes, like he's servicing and not servicing, whatever. And he finally comes up and he realizes no one's coming to help him. And this 11-year-old goes, if I get out of here, I owe each and every one of you an ass whooping. And they just go home. Wow. They don't tell anybody. They just leave this guy to die in the ice. Did he die? No. So Barnum's walking in the city or whatever the next day. Walks by one of his friends who was there with a huge handkerchief over his eye. And he can see he's just beaten. Been battered. Yeah. And he goes, Jesus, what happened to you? And he says, well, he got out. Harry got out. Yeah, he got out. And uh, yeah, runs into him not much longer after that. Says, hey to him. And he goes, I think I owe you an ass whooping. Beats him up in two minutes, makes him cry and go home. And that was that. And then they were friends again. I mean, that's just, it's so interesting to see that type of life. That's. <laughs> anyway, this is, this is not about the service. So this is just about Barnum. I mean, it's just it's Barnum. Really, yeah. It's interesting though. But, but as we wrap up, mm-hmm. I think we should touch on what is the circus now? Uh, yeah. Th- there's, uh, starting in, I guess in the seventies, but more so in the early eighties. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's Cirque Nouveau. Yeah. The new circus. There's this big sp- Big shift, not not I guess not very big on the surface, but it is big and um, and subtle. It was getting such a bad rap from uh, PETA, and uh, the circus was dealing so after hard already War, after World War II, after the advent of television, mm-hmm. especially the draw wasn't there anymore. Yeah, you could go see a movie, you could go watch TV in your in your living room, you could watch and and yeah. something like an elephant that you know you have this big billing like the largest elephant and then yeah. we can see elephants on our well even area. things like yeah. tom thumb and, and the bearded lady and and, and, mm. and lobster boy it's yeah. just not you've big seen all that stuff you, you see yeah. people like that yeah. in real life it's not the new thing anymore either yeah. it's like you want to see these yeah. programs you want to see this new technology yeah. um and then even the the animal acts like yeah they mm. especially in the 60s animal rights groups yeah really yeah. kind of came down on, on circuses and yeah they go after them still still it's funny yeah, yeah i was looking up i was trying to find like the history of PETA in the circus and all i could find was stuff from 2013 yeah and they were outside places throwing red paint on yeah. Ringmasters and and it, it's crazy. They're still Red doing paint it. on clowns. So they're, yeah, so there's still yeah. there, there are still ringmasters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the the, the circus is still around. It's just not making that much money. Anymore. Well, it's n- the traditional all I, circus is. All I, yeah, all I think of mm-hmm. is Cirque du Soleil. Yeah. and that makes and about eight hundred and ten million dollars a year. I yeah. read that. They yeah. do okay. That's crazy. But now yeah. they're doing fine. Here's the they they have an interesting start though because they were in the red. For like three years, and then they had to get bailed out. 
by the government of Canada as like an arts program, and even then they had to tell That's right. It is a Canadian institution. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and then they yeah. they started to figure it out. And it took them a couple of years, and now they're like there isn't a bigger one. Yeah. yeah. But they they started off in really tough waters. They had a, a great idea from the beginning, but and now this is this is kind of the where there's a split, I think, between uh, the Ringling Brothers Brown and Bailey Circus, and then um, like the Big Apple Circus, some of the, the mm-hmm. traditional the Ringmaster and the Ring, and then the animals, the elephants, yeah. and the horses. Yeah. Where like that's still there is novelty. I mean that. But no, I think that the, something that the Nouveau Cirque, like uh-huh. the Cirque du Soleil, um, and there's a several others that are, mm. are big, but uh, I think Cirque du Soleil is the biggest example, mm-hmm. is it focuses less on animal, or like animals. Like no animals at all. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's human mm-hmm. abilities, or human uh, Another really big factor, too, like um, and, and we... And story, well, too. And, and yeah, a, I was going to say... It's it, an arcing story. It's, so the, the ringmaster is uh, the link between... This animal act, then here comes the clowns, and then yeah. you know, pay attention to this now. And look then. over here. Whereas with Cirque du Soleil, they they tr- they try to uh, have this one storyline. They tell a story. Theme, yeah, they'll tell old mythological with, tales. Though with these mm-hmm. feats of human ability, you know. Wasn't there a Mi- Michael Jackson? They one? do have a Michael a Jackson one. Yeah, it's still running. Really? Yeah, they have like seventy shows. Oh, it's crazy. Wow. Um, I don't know how many they run at a time, but you can just read about every single one, and it was way too much for me. I just sort of yeah. they all blended into one after a while because it was like here's this show, and it's about I, Icarus, I and it's like few... what happens to him after he falls and burns the wings, and yeah. it's like he tries to fly again. I'm like that's great, and then the next one was like they they say that, but anyway, yeah, it's, <laughs> the, well, the one of the cool things the though, is, is they got rid of. Uh, there's no separation between the performers at any time during the show. Uh, they never get to go backstage. They never get separated from the audience. So once you're, once the show starts, every single performer is performing 100% of the time for the whole show. And wow. it's the performers who move all the stuff around. They move all the set. Uh, there isn't. Is that for every one of their shows, or is that just for a particular? From what one? I read, but maybe maybe it wasn't. But that was like one of the defining things about them is the curtain never drops. Well, I I think that. There's no That's different than them all staying on stage all the time. Yeah. The cur- the curtain staying up so like if there's no break in action. Yeah. But having different people. See what I was there. reading that was like one one aspect thought. Of it. Yeah. It was no they got rid of the curtain and then they wanted the actors to be there all the time. Yeah. Uh, but I I could have that wrong because I mean that's it, incredible. I yeah, I I've, I've seen But of I've course they are before. Yeah. And I don't Maybe it's one of their shows that they did maybe. that. Uh, but I, I think that is true. The curtain never goes. To, there's no. They don't. They don't use like the um, the cheap tricks of mm-hmm. like. Okay, that's the end of that. Let's just turn the lights off for a second. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's like that's theater one hundred and one. I guess of mm-hmm. okay. So now the eyes is sitting in the dark talking to each other. Or yeah. How long are we gonna sit in the dark? Yeah. You know? <laughs> Give me something to look. Give at. me something to look at. I paid so much money to see this show. One of the things we didn't touch on, but it's kind of fascinating with what happened with this Nouveau Circus, is a lot of what we're seeing, actually, we owe to Lenin. Uh, and he nationalized the circus. The, the in Moscow, the Moscow State Yeah, in 1919. Yeah. And uh, that was the first time ever that you then uh, became trained as a circus performer. And you weren't School. sort of born into it as a family of trapeze artists, and you learned the trade. It wasn't that. It was... It was such a big deal that it had to be nationalized to keep morale up, and they would send circuses out to Siberia. Where we get that story arc actually comes from them. And so now we're sort of playing more to uh, Russia's idea of what the circus was because they had to start from square one. They had all the tricks. They figured that out, but they didn't know the show. And so now we're kind of going back to this, what was a new thing, 80 years before, mm-hmm. but never made it out. Mm-hmm. Now they're doing it again. And I think that's kind of the strength of, of Cirque du Soleil. Or the, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I keep, we keep using that. That's, that's the prime example, I think. Um, yeah, you could name others, but we couldn't really talk running, about them, and maybe. I don't think the listeners would care too much. Yeah. I mean, it's Cirque du Soleil now and anything it like that. It surprises me that there is still the more antiquated idea of the mm-hmm. circus. It still right. exists. But I think that that probably the, what we... Would as we're talking now, we think of the traditional circus. I think probably will die out. 
the the animal and the you know like the, the freak the, the, show version of things has yeah. kind of died out. Sure. You have that stuff on TV, mm-hmm. you know, like it's Ripley's Believe It or Not on the I mean, TV. Yeah, and, TV. And we got strongman competitions. Yeah. We have, yeah, you know, you can go on the internet find a bearded woman. You can yeah. find we have keeping you can go on Craigslist and find a bearded woman. Yeah, I mean, we have plenty of other. We have so <laughs> much shock and awe. Yeah, now. there's no reason to go see it. There's there's something to be said about seeing it in person. But but I also think people now are over the idea of going and standing in front of a tall man and being like yeah. oh my god look how yeah the nba is you're right. so weird and i'm gonna stare yeah. at you i think people are a little more self-conscious about it. yeah i think yeah. i wouldn't feel comfortable going and just oogling some people dwarf. would for sure but i think that the filter of a television screen is yeah a safety yeah. net for most yeah. of us. i'd watch it on television but yeah. i wouldn't go stand in front of someone and go look at you as a <laughs> specimen and i think i think <laughs> that would bother me i think it would bother a lot of people look at you i think yeah. uh, how did this happen <laughs> like look at the unfortunate circumstance that you're in you're weird and wow. now i'm gonna move on and see if there's something more interesting than you you just stay put yeah. other people are coming life just keeps piling it on you doesn't <laughs> yeah. it? um but i think with stay here dance the new <laughs> the nouveau circus again i you know i've, I've seen a, a, a circus of and i, I actually had a couple other circuses kind of like it um there is something to be said for when you're watching a human being yeah. do something 60 feet in the air. Those, and Those acrobatics. And it's, are, and I, I think that's what you're paying for with Cirque du Soleil. I mean, the, the spectacle and the... Um, the thing that you can... The, the storyline is still kind of... You, you could just throw any story on sure. there. You're mm-hmm. seeing the best yeah. gymnasts and acrobatic... Uh, Acrobats mm-hmm. on planet Earth. I don't care what the metaphor is. It doesn't it. matter. To I'm me. sure it's fascinating. You thought way too much about yeah. how this is. <laughs> but but Icarus, I just want to see Icarus and Napoleon mm-hmm. playing cards, and then Harry yeah. Dean. It doesn't matter. Do look a flip. At that guy. Yeah. I look mean, look at what he's they, doing. Look at how many uh, chairs he's stacked up, yeah, and like it's look crazy. at this 50 foot tall ladder yeah. that is like. And he's not even the thing we're supposed to be looking at. He's just in the back as like a decoration. Yeah. He's just part of a set. Beautiful makeup yeah. and feathery costumes. Well, I think we're going to have to wrap it up. Unfortunately, yeah. or I guess maybe even fortunately, we've uh, I feel like ran this, out of time and, really, and could continue to talk. We could just yeah. keep talking about the circus. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I any, think, any final thoughts, any, any points that we didn't cover that you really just you needed to get in? I, I would like to just talk about... P.T. Barnum <laughs> forever. I Let's love start with, that man. Let's fast. start with the P in P.T. Uh, Barnum is Phineas. Yeah. I'm into that. I like a Phineas. Well, we didn't even talk about, I mean, what's what's Barnum and Bailey? Who's Bailey? So Bailey, Bailey was a circus some... entrepreneur and he's much more boring. He just was yeah. running a circus and, and it, it all goes back. Barnum was the marketer. And okay, if I had anything to leave the listeners with, it's this image now. P.T. Barnum was running the greatest show on earth. The biggest circus there was at a time when the circus was the most popular form of entertainment in America, let alone probably the rest of the planet. And he would travel from town to town and set up the biggest thing people had ever seen. Five acres of tents. And they would come to see it. And as the show went on, he would be pulled around in a lounge (laughs) chariot just observing the spectacle he created. You would watch one of the richest, most fascinating people in the world just ride by you, taking a look at it all. And that's what he did every day for like seven years. (laughs) He just hung out in different towns, sitting in a chariot, being pulled around in what you thought was the coolest thing you'd ever seen, going, yeah, "Yeah, we got everything running in order. (laughs) The guy's a fucking Roman (laughs) emperor. He's a Roman emperor. I mean... I don't know if there's like a comparison I could think of to like what our modern day rich men would be It'd doing. It'd have to be a combination like of so many different. Yeah. It's, 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 I it's mean, a, you go spend your money, but you're not just in front of everybody like that. Yeah. And also still just. You know, the idea of the circus reminds me personally of my experience on the work tour. Mm-hmm. We go to these different places, but similar places every day, mm-hmm. set up everything it all looks the same all, once you're there it's just a it big empty the lot same. it all works the same every place you go mm. and then there's kevin lyman mm. the ringmaster yeah who's behind the scenes and and he was riding his bike all around the grounds yeah. every day it's 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 really kind of a, a modern day similar spectacle yeah on, mm-hmm. on, on, on the circus mm. Obviously not as showy. I mean, he would ride around. I'm sure people sure. would recognize him, but people, people would stop and go, what is yeah, this coming by? He isn't being pulled around 
no. horse and buggy. No. <laughs> you know? And I think also outside of the warped or his name would only get so far recognized, you know, outside of that circle. Yes, but but his name is synonymous mm-hmm. with that. Mm-hmm. With that. And what I'm saying is that with P.T. Barnum, yeah. people that never went to the circus, the circus oh, yeah. never came to them. This is like... The only like, reason you didn't is because you couldn't afford to. It's like, uh, you know, like Jay Z and Johnny Manziel <laughs> being co-presidents of the United States. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, you're like a sports and then an entertainment figure, and you're the leader of this, like the most powerful. Yeah. He was a politician. He was a politician. He was, he was a well. mayor yeah. for a while. Oh yeah, yeah. sure. And, he, and a good. I one. mean, it's just, it's just <laughs> like, <laughs> he's just a fascinating guy. It's just like too big, too. Uh-huh. Like uh, his his personality. Mm-hmm. I think definitely. At, at least uh, take a cursory glance at P.T. Barnum, do yourself a favor. Mm-hmm. Um, He's got a great autobiography. Just go read that. It's called The Life and Times as Written by P.T. Barnum. And it's just the language in it. It's so easy to read, but fascinating. It's like a really good description of the time, this 1811 to 1890. And he just led what could possibly be the most interesting life of anyone on earth in that 100 years. Yeah. Without a doubt. I mean... It's worth the read. If I learn anything from the circus, Barnum is fascinating. Yeah. I and mean, everything else is pretty cool. Yeah. But he just took, stole the show. And, and that's just kind of part of his personality. was part of his thing. He stole the show the second I learned anything about him other than Barnum and Bailey. Yeah. I don't care about the Ringling Brothers. They just did what he did. There were too with, many of them. Yeah. Just more of it. Yeah. You know, they didn't have, they stole the marketing. They, they did the same show, but bigger. Same thing as I don't really care what Bailey was doing before or William Koo. These people don't matter. It's Barnum all the way. And he was only in the it's game. The he way. was only in the game for about a decade. Yeah. Everybody else was in it for life and none yeah, of them could even great. keep up. Keep up, yeah. I think um, also just a less heavy investment of time or energy, but kind of fun. Just look up greatest circus acts of all time or, um, you know, top circus performances or something like that. Some great characters, some great videos yeah. too. I mean, some, some of the modern stuff, the contemporary mm-hmm. stuff, but just some really interesting lives that people have, have led mm-hmm. on stage. Yeah. yeah. I, I think we, we easily could have spent this time so much differently. We could have talked about individual acts. We could have totally. talked about the totally. myriad of, of people, but there's just so much to learn. And, and I think as the audience probably knows by now, they're, they're it's so easy to go find this stuff. And we just kind of scratched the surface boat. Well, um, I think that w- that may be one of the most surprising things about this is that it is so rich in history. Mm-hmm. When, I think that when you think about the circus, mm-hmm. you have – everybody has a similar image of what that is. Yeah, you get that pop culture reference. You get right. that big top, the elephant. But the actual, the actual lives these people lived, uh-huh. I mean, not yeah. just not just the performers and like, you know, Barnum mm-hmm. and stuff, but just – it was a, um, a traveling Hollywood. Is it? Yeah, yeah. It, and it's the it was yeah it was the Hollywood that came comes to your town. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like it's that big, and everyone involved mm-hmm. had an interesting kind of life. Yeah. yeah, there there were people who did similar acts. You had uh, trapeze artists and uh, acrobats, sing and had, individual. But then you had the ones that that the changed the game. Yeah, the, the bearded yeah. woman, no. all the different clowns, and the, I mean that was that was something I couldn't get through. There were so many clowns that were clowns. so influential. I was like, all these names are just like French names. And it was like this clown, <laughs> and he like wore his makeup just slightly this way, <laughs> and really changed the whole game. And I was like, well, that's great. And then there's just like fifteen <laughs> of those. But. Yeah, that's great. The last thing here is, uh, as an audience, what you need to take away is next time someone comes up to you and you have a, a conversation about the circus and you're talking to somebody who brings up Circus Maximus and suggests that that's when the circus started, you could know you're just talking to an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Philip keep that in mind. If, yeah, if you learn anything, it's, it started with Philip Astley and P.T. Barnum. P.T. Barnum took it over the top. Everybody else in between, Hughes, we don't need to know about Hughes. Joshua Purdy Brown. Uh, you guys even remember what that was about? All he did was... That was the New York guy. The Zool- yeah, Somers. Yeah, that was kind of fun. I, but still, it's just weird. It's just not nearly as fascinating. He's yeah. the guy with the tent. Anyway, it's all about... Just look it up yourself. Just look up. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is the point. We, we yeah. talk about it. We spark your interest. Yeah. yeah. You take it away. Okay. So, what about next week? So, next week, we will be tackling... Scientology. It's a big one. I, 
It's a big one. I have my views. I have my knowledge and my opinion on it. Uh, a great amount of that isn't so informed. Although I, I feel like this this will be the first one that we do where I have a little bit of base knowledge going in. Yeah, I've yeah. read a little bit on it. I couldn't tell you exactly what it is that they believe, but I have this feeling that not a lot of them can either. Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> I think that uh, going into it, this one I know a little bit about. I kind of on a dare at one point went to a Scientology Ooh. center with my, uh, my old roommate, and uh, it was it was a pretty odd few hours of my life before mm. going and then going and then we're, we're definitely the night after. Mm. That. Um, so I I definitely I already have some personal yeah. I think views I think we all do the, and I yeah. think that this is the kind of thing that the listeners yeah will have so, at least more relation I would say that I'm interested in, in finding out more about the organization and, and the people and um, mm. who's drawn to it why they're drawn to it mm -hmm. um, the system of of getting people in the door mm -hmm. uh, I think my views in general about it, I'd be pretty shocked if anything like change my opinion or like, mm -hmm. you know, but yeah. I am interested to know yeah. more about the, the nuts and bolts of it is kind of interesting. I think this is going to be a, a tough one to do uh, without bias. Yeah, um, for sure. I think we should definitely focus on facts and information mm -hmm. and not our opinions on how we yep. feel about them. Uh, but I think the three of us are fully capable of doing just that. Yeah. So I think that, that for me, or, and I think that'll be good for the the audience. Yeah. I and think for, it and should for, be. For, yeah, and for all of us, it should be. Um, this is as far as we can find. Works. This yeah. is what's happening, not this is how we yeah. feel this about this some, happening. Some yeah, fringe thing or anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. Scientology is very interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we um, we will do our own independent research from mm -hmm. each other, and then come back and see what we found that's the same. Anything interesting? Anyone? Found on their own, mm -hmm. put it together, trying to paint a little picture. Yeah. All right. What's what's the deal with Scientology? Perfect. I'm Martin Wallace. I'm Darren McCarthy. I'm Dan Fury. This yeah. is the Fundamentals. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.